Okay. So uh, what you see there, what you see, Brenda gets that that amount once a month. Um, so typically, what you see in the bulletin is less than what we actually receive. So that's kind of a positive thing. I didn't even think about that until we were talking about it in the board meeting last week. So. Any other announcements that we need to be aware of? All right. Our call to worship is Psalm chapter 29. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And, his temp and in his temple, everyone says glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your goodness. And we would just ask, Lord, that you would guide us today. As we come to you, Lord, if there are things that are keeping us from focusing on you, I pray, Lord, that we would just be able to allow those things to slip away. And Lord, that uh, all of the distractions that are keeping us from you, I pray, Lord, would be gone and we might be able to give you our full focus and our full attention. We dedicate this time to you now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll be right up, you later. Go on to something else. I'm ready. Okay. Will, Will, Will Bird's time for it. Why are you just carrying that? I don't know. Oh. Good morning. How are we all doing today? You notice we changed the decorations? We thought we, if we put some snowflakes in the church, maybe it won't snow outside the church. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> you don't think that'll work, Ken? <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I don't fault Josh for oversleeping because if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be here. I was sleeping really nice. And she, you got to get up. We got to get to church. Uh, so just get away, Josh. You won't be late again. <laughs> you like that, did you? Is that how that works? Why do you stay with me we sing How Great Thou Art? <laughs>
so much more. And the high mountains, you know, you ever been up the high mountains? And you, wow, you know. But God is so much more, isn't he? And what a great God we have that he's done what he's done for us. Better is one day.
so wonderful that we won't miss anything. We won't even worry about anything anymore. <laughs> Ancient of days. Oh, he's trying to kill me. You are 
Good morning. <laughs> Songs are a good reminder of how we should be looking for the Lord in everything that we do and say. Our scripture lesson today is Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they had come down, prayed for, for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, oh, guess that's it. The Lord bless the reading of his word today. Um, as far as praises and praises, <laughs> We have quite a few that uh, have come in throughout the week. Larry Donnelly is in the step-down unit of the ICU. Um, Ruth called me this morning and then we got cut off because somebody else was calling. She thought maybe that was uh, Larry's doctor. I'm getting a little echo here, guys. Uh, so, need to be praying for Larry. And then uh, Ruth also co contacted me, Ruth Donnelly, asking for prayer for a friend. And I can't remember the name of the friend, and I was just looking for it on Facebook, and maybe I forgot to post it. So I'll be praying for Ruth's friend also. So Larry and Ruth's friend. Did you want to give us an update on Kathy, Lee? Well, right now she's in Bowling Green, waiting to be transferred to Toledo. Uh, she had a heart attack uh, a couple of days ago. And they test her over, but she's not sick, so okay. uh, but, uh, what we need to do is pray for all of Nancy's children. She's got five kids. Her oldest daughter, Karen, is trying to serve the Lord. I don't know how she's struggling with that. She, there's just a lot of things she don't want to give up, her cigarettes and <laughs> whatever. I know they all, they were all brought up in a Christian home. Uh, other, other than Chris, I don't know any of them that are really serving the Lord. But pray for all of them. Any others? Praises or prayers? Miss <coughs> yep. Powell. Mrs. Powell. Sherry's not feeling well this morning. My sister Mary. you stand with me and we'll pray together. Oh, by the way, the Mary that we've been praying for, I don't know if I mentioned, she is home now. If I mentioned it in worship service, but uh, she's home and she seems to be doing fairly well. She still has, uh, I think they're doing her therapy via Zoom, <coughs> so she's able to get on the computer and do that, but she still has a lot of traveling, a little about two hours from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and that's where she's doing her a lot of her checkups and stuff. So, Lord, we want to thank you for your presence here with us today. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to worship you. We are so thankful to be able to come into your presence and to worship you today and to know that you are here with us. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the strength that you give us from day to day. And we thank you for answers to prayer. You are a great and mighty God, and it is so good to be able to be here. So we come to you today, Lord, we, we want to pray that uh, you would continue to bless this church. And I pray, Lord, for your guidance in all that we do. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified through all that we do and say. We want to pray also, Lord, for our nation and for our leaders. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who are in authority <coughs> over us. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we would have godly leaders who love you and who desire to serve you and have uh, discernment that they would be sensitive to your leading and guiding, Lord, that they would be courageous to follow through with that. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide our leaders, and Lord, that you would put them into office and remove them from office based on uh, uh, whether they're willing to submit to you or not. We want to pray also, Lord, for uh, the people around us that protect us. Think of Lord. Think, Lord, of our. 
medical personnel, our first responders, our military personnel, Lord, all of those people that are putting themselves in harm's way uh, to protect us. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would protect them, and keep them safe physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Lord, especially now with our healthcare workers, as it seems like COVID is on the rise once again. We know that this is a very stressful time for our co for our medical workers. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would provide for them the assistance that they need and the supplies that they need. And uh, Lord, we pray for healing for those that are struggling with COVID right now. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, you would be with all of those people. We pray, Lord, again today, that you would bring an end to COVID. After two years, it's just, it's tiring. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would stop it. I want to pray also, Lord, for the concerns that were mentioned today. We think of Larry and we ask, Lord, for your touch and for your healing in his body. Lord, give uh, wisdom and discernment to those who are providing care for him. He may receive the best care possible. And we pray also, Lord, for Ruth and we ask, Lord, that you would be with her. And uh, Lord, give her extra strength right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would help her with the decisions that she might need to make. Pray also, Lord, for Kathy, and we ask, Lord, for your touch and for your healing in her body. And uh, we pray that this heart attack has not done a great deal of damage. Uh, and we just pray, Lord, for healing and guidance there. We pray also, Lord, for Ruth's friend, and we ask that you would be with her. And uh, we pray for healing in that situation as well. Pray for Mrs. Powell, and we pray, Lord, for your healing for her. Uh, a lot of what she's dealing with is depression. You know, Lord, there are also physical issues there, and I pray for your guidance and for your help for her. Be with Sherry, and I pray, Lord, for your strength and for your guidance for her and the things that she's struggling with. And uh, we pray also, Lord, that you would be with um, Mary. We pray that you would continue to give her victories, that she might continue to improve, and we pray, Lord, that uh, she would be able to eat the food that she needs to eat. And, I pray, Lord, that you would give her a desire to eat these foods. We want to thank you today, Lord, for your presence with us. And now, as we spend time in your word, I pray that you would, uh, your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word to us. That we might understand, that we might grow. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're kind of continuing on today with the message I started last week. Last week was God killing plagues. And uh, since it's starting out with uh, God, it's a capital G, but it should be a small G because the, the gods that are being killed are the Egyptian gods that are the fake gods. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 8, beginning with verse 20. In just a moment here, but uh, continuing on from last week. Uh, and reminding you again of the history of where we are. The Israelites have been slaves in Egypt for, it seems like it was about 460 years. And of that 460 years, a good share of it, I think they had been slaves in Egypt. And so that had to be very, very difficult for them. And they cried out to God. They asked God to deliver them from this life of slavery. God brought Moses and uh, Moses began dealing with Pharaoh. But it seems like every time that Moses dealt with Pharaoh, uh, the restrictions and the work had become harder and harder for the Israelites. And now God is going to demonstrate his power <coughs> to Pharaoh and the Egyptians through these uh, powerful plagues that he's bringing. These are events that are bringing, striking a blow against the Egyptian gods with a small g and uh, just making, um, it just seems to me as, as, with each one of these plagues, God is knocking, knocking the feet out or knocking down these, uh, these fake gods that the, the Egyptians have created. And so this morning, we're going to look at uh, the one true God who was not created in a human's mind, but has been around for eternity. And we're going to look at three more events, three more plagues that God brings on the, the Egyptians. So beginning with Exodus chapter 8, beginning with verse 20. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Intercede for me. Then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servant, and from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from the people not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart, and at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle, in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died, but the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from the furnace, and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils to break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Then they took the ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moses and scattered them toward heaven. And they caused boils to break out, on sore, break out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said to Moses. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. So the first event, we'd already looked at the first three plagues. Uh, the, the Nile turned into blood, frogs came out of the Nile, uh, invaded all of the land, and then there were gnats, and now we've got flies, flies in the Egyptian territory. This is the, the fourth event, starting with verse four, with the event number four, just going along with all of these, uh, these plagues. And as Moses goes into Pharaoh this time, he gives a full explanation. This is what I'm going to do. God had told Moses to tell Pharaoh, exactly to lay out very clearly he goes out early in the morning they go out to pharaoh and as they go out to pharaoh um, what they what uh, moses says is again let my people go and as he goes on from there he says if you don't let my people go uh, you're going to have these swarms of flies that come in now they're in a in an area of the the mediterranean where 
there are all kinds of varieties of flies, and I guess someone has figured out that there's one variety of fly that'll lay thousands of eggs at a time. So you can just imagine if all of these eggs hatch at the same time, it's going to be quite a, a nasty situation. And you know, while I come up, I just want you to, to wanted to be clear that as we look at these natural explanations of what happened here, there's also the supernatural part of it with the timing that God was able to cause this plague come at this particular time. And it appears as if it only lasts for like maybe 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. At a very particular time, this plague begins and then it ends at a particular time. And so this is very, uh, very specific in that way. But God had already told Pharaoh or through Moses that there were going to be consequences. If you don't let my people go, these flies are going to come into the land. And if you've ever been in a fly infestation, it's not pleasant. Uh, and I mean, just imagine, you're, they're walking through their houses, they're walking through the land, they're stepping on the flies, the flies are hitting them in their face. But one of the things that happens this time that's unique about these plagues is it doesn't happen in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites are living. They don't have this, uh, this plague. And uh, so... Uh, it's a little bit different this time. So we're talking about the different uh, gods, Egyptian gods that God deals with in these. One of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped or would have paid tribute to was the, the uh, god that had the head of a fly. I don't know exactly what, what it was that her I think this was a goddess, if I remember right. Yeah, it was a goddess that had the uh, the head of a fly. And just imagine, Pharaoh is a man who worships and pays tribute to this god that has goddess that has the head of a fly. And now the flies are so thick in the land of Egypt that it becomes a menace to him. God has taken something that these people would worship and pay tribute to, and he's caused it to become a menace in their sight. And when Pharaoh calls upon Moses and he says, pray, entreat the Lord, pray for me, that God would remove this menace. Just imagine, in Pharaoh's mind, he's got to be saying, I'm fed up with this. Almost as if Pharaoh is saying, I'm fed up with this fly goddess thing. And that he doesn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. And so we look at this and it almost appears as if Pharaoh is becoming compliant. He's saying, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to allow you to go. Uh, but in verse 25, he's kind of setting on limitations where he's saying, I I'm willing to let you do what you're going to say, but I'm still the guy that's in control. And so as you look at... Uh, Verse 25, Pharaoh called for Moses and he said, go sacrifice to your God and the land. But Moses understands, he says, we need to get out of the land because if we stay in the land, the, the sacrifices that we make and the festival that we have is going to be uh, an abomination to the Egyptians. So we need to get out of the sight of the Egyptians. And so Moses and Aaron kind of go back, or Moses and Pharaoh go back and forth on this. And Pharaoh finally says, okay, you can take three days trip into the wilderness and you can go and you can, uh, you can make your sacrifices from there. But Pharaoh continues to say, entreat the Lord for me. You remember back when, when Moses first went to Pharaoh and he says, we want to go into the wilderness so that we can worship this God. And Pharaoh's response was, I don't know this God. One of the things that's jumped out to me as I've been studying this is the number of times that you see in these verses the phrase, the Lord. Over and over and over again, Moses is saying, as he says to Pharaoh, the Lord has said to me, the Lord wants, those types of things. And now we've even got Pharaoh saying to Moses, entreat the Lord for me. 
perhaps Pharaoh is beginning to see that uh, his gods are not everything that they're cracked up to be. And perhaps Pharaoh is beginning to see that there's a God. And I'm guessing probably Pharaoh is maybe including this in his pantheon of gods, not necessarily looking at God as supreme, but you're beginning to see his heart soften maybe just a little bit. As we're talking about this, I want to go back to that idea that there were no flies in the land of Goshen. Imagine that you were an Israelite and you know that this plague that God has brought on the Egyptians, but God has spared you. Don't you think that had to make the Israelites really feel special? Really understand how much God loved them and how much God cared for them. That he was willing to protect them from this plague. And also, once again, to emphasize the supremacy of God. They're living in a land where there are all kinds of gods. We're going to look at, as we go through this, I think there's ten plagues, and you know we can connect that with ten different Egyptian gods, goddesses. And God is just really emphasizing through this that there is one God, and he's showing himself supreme constantly through this. And just imagine having lived in this land for 460 years, how these Egyptian gods and goddesses had probably influenced the Israelites, but now they're beginning to see once again, there's one true God, and that's our God, and he cares for us so much. The fifth event is that we've got diseased Egyptian livestock. Moses again goes to Pharaoh and he requests, let my people go. And if you refuse to let my people go, there's going to be diseases that come on uh, the livestock. And once again, we see a time that's connected with this. Probably the, the flies that were in the land had caused a disease to come on the, the, this livestock. But this time, um, in verse 3, he says, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your, the cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. But he's talking specifically this time about the, uh, the, the, the livestock that are out in the field. We have to make a distinct distinction here because later uh, there's more livestock that's killed. But uh, he says this time it's the livestock that are in the field. And then again, the timing, verse 5. Then the Lord appointed a set time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. There's one day that's set aside where this is going to happen. And this pestilence is going to afflict the Egyptian livestock. Timing. But once again, he's going to spare the Israelites in the land of Goshen. They're not going to have this. But one of the unique things about this is Moses said that this is going to happen tomorrow. Why might that be? Maybe so the Egyptians that were starting to see what was going on would have a chance to get their livestock out of the field so that they could protect themselves. One of the Egyptian gods was Ra. He had the head of a cow. Another one of the, uh, the uh, Egyptian gods going down. And so maybe there was this period of time, this 24 hours for the Egyptians to get their, their livestock out of the field. And things happened just as predicted. Even from the very beginning, as Moses began this, as God began speaking with Moses in the wilderness, saying that he was going to send him back to Egypt to deal with Pharaoh, he said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And we see time and again that Pharaoh's heart remains hard. Can you imagine being an Egyptian going out in the field and bringing your livestock in? What if Pharaoh saw? What if Pharaoh knew what you were up to? I suspect that these people could have gotten in trouble for bringing their livestock in. 
but I suspect that there are also people that were there that were protecting themselves, despite what Pharaoh might have been doing. And then the sixth event is, is the, uh, the boils on the Egyptians. And I don't know if you've noticed, but he, there's, these plagues are kind of divided up into to groups of three. And Moses kind of follows, this, or the God follows the same pattern with the third one in each group. He just goes out and he does it. He doesn't tell them what's going on. And so you've got Moses and Aaron coming into the, uh, the presence of Pharaoh this time. And they've got hands, handfuls of soot from furnaces. Presumably these furnaces were the furnaces that, that the Israelites were using to, to bake bricks. They'd taken this soot from these furnaces and they tossed it up in the air in the presence of Pharaoh. And it becomes boils on their skin. Boils on their skin. There were flies in that area that would bite and they would produce a sore that looked a lot like a boil on the skin. It wouldn't have been the flies from the first plague, but maybe they had laid eggs from that first plague. And now it's time for those fly, those eggs to hatch out once again. But again, look at the timing. Moses throws the soot up in the air and the boils break out. This time it was an attack on Isis, the <coughs> goddess of medicine and peace. Something that she couldn't take care of. God was the only one that could take care of it. And one of the humorous things that we see in these verses is, I find it humorous anyway, but I'm kind of sick. The magicians are so afflicted that they cannot stand in the presence of Pharaoh with these boils. I think there's a good reason for that. You've got these magicians, and I'm assuming these magicians were probably religious leaders of that particular day, religious leaders for Pharaoh, you know, in the book of James, chapter 3, verse 1, it says that uh, teachers are going to be judged more strictly. And so these religious leaders, these magicians, perhaps are being judged for pointing people astray, taking them away from God, and pointing them in a different direction. Through these verses of scripture, I see powerfully the supremacy of God. <coughs> Excuse me. The supremacy of God. The Egyptians were people that worshipped a whole bunch of different gods. When I use that word pantheon of God, that's just a, a way to describe all of the gods that the Egyptians would have worshipped. And so, you know, you can imagine in each one of these, you've got the God with the head of a fly. The Egyptians would have worshipped that and paid tribute to it. The, uh, the, the god with the head of a, a cow, the Egyptians would have worshipped that and paid tribute to that. Isis, who was the <clears throat> goddess of medicine, the Egyptians would have paid tribute to that and worshipped that god. But God just continues to knock them down. And he's saying there's one true god. Not all of these different gods, there's one true god. And God is proving himself supreme, not only in the eyes of the Israelites, but the Egyptians as well. Or you could go the other way, not just the Egyptians, but in the Israelites as well. And just helping these people understand there's one true God. That same for us today. We have one God that we worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God that we worship and that we look to. You know, a lot of times it comes into our lives that when things don't go the way that we want, we can look in different places. But a lot of, uh, we need to make sure that we're looking to God primarily and supremely. When things aren't going our way, I mean, there are going to be times when we need to go and, and seek help in other places. I was just watching a little video clip this morning of my friend talking about his daughter being born. She was born with... Uh, blood clots and uh, blood clots on the brain and brain bleeding. The doctor said we can only deal with one of those issues. Whichever one we deal with is probably going to make the other one worse. And so he was praying, I was praying, I think I had our church praying, lots of people praying. When they went and did the next scan on this little girl, all of that was gone. 
It wasn't God is the supreme healer, the supreme doctor. There wasn't anything wrong with them going and seeing this doctor, these doctors, and getting help for this little girl. But he knew that the ultimate healing was going to happen with her by God. And so we need to make sure that, that God is the place where we are going when we're looking for rescue in the troubles that we might be going through. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your presence here with us today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to always keep you first. Sometimes it's easy to become distracted. Sometimes <coughs> it's easy to look in other places for help. But I would ask today that you would just help us to, to remain focused on you and to understand the supremacy of you. Lord, help us to just turn our hearts completely and totally over to you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Stay with me as we sing wonderful words of life. 